Okay. Can everybody see my screen? We can. Great. Okay. I've only got a couple of slides um, because I want to make sure that there's time for um, some questions. So I thought I'd give you a little brief overview of the Henry Smith charity um, and talk about our two main grants programmes, but mainly focusing on our Improving Lives programme. So the Henry Smith Charity... Oh. <laughs> so the Henry Smith Charity was established in 1628. We're a very old endowed foundation. Um, it was founded by Henry Smith, who was a property owner. Um, for those of you that want that may be interested, um, none of the money that went into the endowment came from slavery because this was pre-slavery and his all his income was from property. Um, and he spent the last few years of his life uh, setting up the charity who didn't want people to live in poverty. Um, his his relatives, the descendants of his sister or indeed the general population, he wanted to do good with the money that he'd raised. Um, so we have quite a few grants programmes, um, some smaller grants, grants programmes, um, but I'm going to talk today about our main grants programme, which is um, where we spend most of the money, um, improving lives and strengthening communities programme. Um, and last year, I'm really proud of the team and everybody at Henry Smith because we had a record year. We spent over budget. We actually awarded £30 million in main grants, um, and some of that was our regular grant making, which we didn't stop throughout the lockdown. We felt it was really important that organisations still had those opportunities to apply for running costs, et cetera. Um, but we also gave some additional um, support grants to our grant holders to deal with the impact of, of COVID-19. In our main grants programme, we'll fund uh, grants up to three years and organisations can reapply up to up to nine years in total. So we have a, a kind of long-term relationship with some of our grant holders. And we receive over 250 eligible applications each quarter. So it's very competitive. Um, there's a two-stage process. Um, at stage one, uh, we have a, a team of 22 assessors across the organization. Each application, is assessed by at least two people and if they disagree it goes to a third person and about 20 percent of those get through to stage two so um as i say it, it's competitive we get a lot of good good applications from good organizations um and what i would say my top tip really if you're going to apply to us is please tell us everything Treat us as if we're children. Don't assume we know anything about the issue that you're dealing with, the community that you're working with. Spell it all out for us because we can only assess the words that are on the page. If you put links in to your website or other things, we don't look at those because we have an equitable process where we just look at what's written and the evidence in the application. And that's really the main reason that applications decl get declined at that first stage is that we don't have that information, that the evidence of need is not there, um, that, that sometimes the intervention might seem too light touch to us because maybe the applicant hasn't really spelt out exactly what they're doing. Um, so that's the importance of making sure that you really explain everything to us. Um, the good news is, though, for anybody that does get through to stage two, it sort of flips the other way around. And I have seen an increase in this. I used to say that at stage two, um, it was around 80 to 85 percent that are awarded. And actually, that's gone up, which is a good thing for us. We don't want to waste people's time. It's about 90 to 95 percent now are awarded at, at stage two. Um, and... I advise anybody applying to allow for a six month process end to end. It can be quicker, but that's kind of the maximum amount of time that it can take. So a little bit about our Strengthening Communities programme. Um, this is a programme which is based on activities. We want it to be 
uh, community organisations embedded in the community, running multiple activities for all members of their communities. And what we're looking for here is organisations that are either based in or next to areas of deprivation. So for England, that's the 10% um, most deprived areas. This programme is based for, for smaller organisations, so organisations with an income range from 20 to K to 500K. And the grant size is 60K per year for three years, so 180K for a grant. And we say that this is for running costs, so um, the money can be flexible about the way that it's used. However, we can be flexible about that because although we think running costs is the most helpful thing, we have had feedback from some organisations that actually they prefer to allocate it to a specific project and that's fine too if, that, if that's better. Um, for these strengthening community grants, the, the reasons that grants are not approved um, at stage two are to do with governance and management issues and safeguarding and the programme is UK wide. So our Improving Lives programme is different because where, whereas the Strength in Communities programme is all about activities and providing activities, the Improving Lives um, programme is all about outcomes, Get, taking people on a journey and um, evidencing that by the change that you'll see for the, with the people that you're working with. The organisational income range is higher, so we will fund organisations with an income up to 3 million. Uh, the grant size is the same, 60k a year, 180k over three years, and it can be for running costs or project costs, what, whatever is most suitable for the organisation. We're not interested as an organisation in funding new, shiny, innovative projects um, and nor are nor do we want people to sort of repackage what they do and they do well to make it look like something new we we know that organizations do really good work they know what works they're good at doing it and we want to fund those organizations so we want to fund people with a track record of getting good outcomes and we'll support them to carry on doing that um, and the main reasons grants are not approved in the Improving Life programme, like strengthening communities to do with governance and management issues, safeguarding, but also to do with outcomes. And it's a UK wide programme again. So the, the areas, rather than say, as an organisation, we want to fund this type of organisation or this type of community, or this group of people. Our priority areas are based on th uh, themes and outcomes related to those themes. Um, so I'm not going to go through them all, they're all on the website, but we've defined them, we've defined what we mean by that, and we've got some suggested um, outcomes, but we are not dictating the outcomes because we're really mindful that you know, as organisations, you're reporting to multiple funders on all sorts of different things. So what we would expect you to do is select one of these themes. You can select up to three, but you can also just select one. And in the, the outcomes that you say that you're going to collect should relate to the themes that you've selected. So you choose what you're already collected and see what's most appropriate to the theme or themes that you choose. As I say, um, choosing one is fine. You don't have to choose three different ones. Um, if, it, if there's one and it's most relevant to what you do and you've got three or four really critical outcomes that meet that theme, then um, please do include those. Um, the, the other thing, and I know all funders say this, read the guidance. It will save you so much time it may take time in the beginning, but we, but it's worth it because then you've got the best chance of putting a really good application in. But also, you'll know whether we're the right funder for you, and we may not be, and so it's important for you to find that out too. Um, we do 
offer the opportunity for anybody that applies to us to get feedback. If you get if you get um, a declination letter at stage one, you can call us up or, or fill in the inquiry form and we will give you specific feedback about the strengths and weaknesses of the application that was submitted. Um, and then the same at stage two, we will contact you if the, if the trustees don't approve the grant, we will go through the reasons why. And organisations can reapply then in a year's time. And we've had feedback from organisations that um, the information that they've been given, if they haven't been awarded a grant, has been really helpful. And many have come back to us and applied and been successful. Um, we do have a telephone number, but what I would advise really, if you do want to contact us, is to fill in the inquiry form on the website, because that way you're not going to go around the uh, telephone loop system and end up with somebody who might not be the most appropriate person to speak to. Whereas if you fill in the inquiry form, we can make sure that that's directed to the best person to respond to you. And we do aim to respond to all the inquiries within three working days. Um, so I'm going to end that now and give uh, everyone the opportunity to ask questions. Thanks, Babs. Well, there hasn't been anything posted in the chat, so I don't know if anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask and perhaps raise their hand and we can hand over to you. <clears throat> Derek. Hello, thank you for that. Yeah, um, area of need. Um, I'm not quite sure how various projects that I'm involved in fit into that category. Can we just can you just say a little bit more about what you mean by those areas of need? Is it a geographical or is it, for example, areas of need like um, recovery from uh, addiction? Um, so for the Strength in Communities programme, uh, that the area of need, you know, for that is very much based on location, geographic, as I say, those are for um, organisations working with people living in areas of deprivation. For, um, for the Improving Lives programme, we, we ask organisations to describe what the need is. So into that comes in um, multiple things really. So we want to know who the people are that you're working with or, or your organisation is made up of. What are the needs and what and why is it, what is the uniqueness to your area or your organisation? So that's where a geographic need might come in. So we, do, we, won't know, um, we won't know about all the areas around the UK and the issues people face in those areas. So we want you to tell us about that. We have specialist grants managers in our team who might know a lot about certain issues but we expect you to spell it all out for us because they may not be the ones assessing that particular application. So that's when I, I you know, mentioned about don't assume that we know anything about anything. Um, and also what's really good is um, including some statistics and data about the particular issue or community that you're working with. And that can be uh, national data to reinforce the case for need, but also it can be local data about how many people may be affected by the issue um, that, that you're trying to address in your area. Does that answer your question, Derek? Thank you. Thanks, Derek. And um, there have been a couple of questions popped into the chat function, and um, Bab. So um, there's one specifically. Um, we're just looking around whether they were in an area close enough to, to um, deprivation. They're based um, in Chorley, um, so they want to know whether they'd be close enough. That's something you can answer, Babs. Um, not without, not, not without no, no. meeting and going on to the postcode checker. Um, okay. So if you go onto our website, um, it, what we're really looking for is a community organisation that is made up of and that is run by and for members of that community in an area of, of deprivation. Now, we did used to say that you had to actually be located in that area, but we got a lot of feedback um, from potential applicants 
where, for example, the area of deprivation, there may not be any office space or space big enough for a community centre and people were in literally in adjoining postcode areas and it made them ineligible. So that's why we've expanded it to be so that it can be next to. I guess the principle is what we don't want is, is an organisation that sort of parachutes into an area that they have to have that they actually have no connection with. It's that principle about it being um, in and of the community that it's working with. But we recognise that sometimes that's not practical in terms of having a building or a centre to work from um, for that community. So we do have a postcode checker on our website um, in the Strength in Community Guidelines. And I, I, I guess the thing is to make sure that the postcode of the location of the organisation is adjacent to the community and the evidence is there that it's um, in and of that community. Thanks, Babs. Um, there's a question from Andy. Um, he's based in Salisbury and um, he wants to know, um, can, can you um, can you speak to you before applying to see whether they are better suited to applying to the Proving Life programme or the Strengthening Communities? Absolutely, yeah. Just fill in the inquiry on the uh, form on the website and somebody will get back and, and uh, talk through that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Jo, um, she is an existing grant holder with you, so she says thank you. Um, uh, she said, um, for an application, are you happy to fund the same service? Um, you mentioned in your presentation that you want to continue to fund existing projects, but also anything looking for something new. Uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, it, we, we call it continuation funding, but it's not really continuation funding um, because you can apply for something different, but you can also apply for the same thing. We, we want to be as helpful as possible for to organisations. And we recognise that sometimes organisations might have applied to us for something which they've now got another pot of funder, funding for, or maybe there's a more appropriate funding and they want to apply for something slightly different and that's fine too, or running costs. It doesn't have to be project costs. Um, so yeah, absolutely. For, for anybody reapplying, what I would say, uh, again, read the guidelines because um, the uh, original grants in our, we launched our strategy in 2017 and we started our first three year grant awards under the new strategy in 2018. So a lot of organisations are coming up to um, the, the end of their three year grant and reapplying. And we have tightened up and we've learned from uh, what we've funded. So again, it's that thing about don't assume anybody that's got funding already that they'll automatically get funding again. We treat every application as if it's a brand new one. It's still only the words on a page because it's not fair to say just because we know this organisation, they have an advantage to another. So again, it's about treating it as if it's a brand new application to a to a new funder, um, but also including positive outcomes from the, the work we've been funding in that application, uh, as you would do with any, any other funder. But yeah, I would, I would say to anybody reapplying, you know, review the guidance on the website and um, especially around the outcomes guidance, because we have sort of tightened up things on that. Thanks, Rebs. There's a couple of questions uh, relating to your Improving Lives programme. Um, one is looking at, is there a maximum percentage of income that you can award? And through, through all our programmes, really, we, um, we don't want to end up being uh, funding more than 50% of an organisation. That's, that's too much of an investment for us in one organisation. And we would expect an organisation to have, you know, a, a diverse range of funding streams. And we don't want to be the, the one funder that the organisation is heavily reliant on. Um, so as I would say that, that that is the main thing to think about in terms of proportion of funding compared to organi organisational income. Thank you. And the other one on the Improving Nice Grant Programme, um, there 
uh, they wanted to know whether there was any um, exception to the maximum three million turnover. So for example, um, I think it's Caroline that's asked the question. Um, they're actually a special needs, um, part of a special needs um, school academy. Um, so their annual income is over 15 million. Oh, uh, <laughs> hmm. that would be a challenge. This is a really difficult one for us um, because ideally we wouldn't have an exceptions, but we do. But we have it for a clear reason. And that is because there's some organisations, um, for example, uh, there are organisations that might manage people's uh, personal care budgets, etc. So, so their accounts look inflated or there are organisations providing accommodation for people and, and, you know, it's money in, money out kind of thing. Um, so the, the accounts look inflated. So we will consider those. So um, without knowing, I mean, that's, that's a huge amount beyond our exceptional circumstance, uh, our exceptional actually 15 million. I think we, we would look up to 5 million or so, but that's probably outside of what we would consider I'm afraid yeah because that's that's a multi-academy so there are seven schools underneath it and I always get confused and want to ask the funders that will fund a special school you know is do I send you the big accounts or do you want separate budgets for that school so I never I sort of asking that question I never know where I sort of go with it so you really would look at a multi-academy with that amount of money even though it's for it's specifically for one school with a lower income budget of like 1.4 million? Um, I think that, I think you might need to contact us directly about that. We don't generally fund schools. Okay. Um, we do fund projects for, um, you know, for and with people with learning disabilities, etc. Yeah. Um, we don't generally fund schools. Um, so it would have to be, a specific project rather than a general so if it was like a soft play area which is not which we can't fund through the statutory money that might be something that you might look at so i don't that, think that's, i don't think that's going to fit with us i don't think we're the right funder for you um in this okay report, i'm afraid okay all right thank you thank you um, and, and sticking with that sort of theme, Babs, Emma's got a question. Um, they run an, a, a charity for an, with animals, um, and they want to know whether they'd be um, precluded at all. Um, they've specifically got a project which is bringing um, animals into um, respite care. Um, well, it's about what it's about what the aim of the project was and uh, is, and what the outcomes are. Um, so, if there are you know, we, we wouldn't fund an animal charity because it's an animal charity. Um, that is not what we would do. But we have funded projects where, um, you know, it, it might be a project that is riding for the disabled, etc., which is, the, you know, it's, it's an animal charity, but the project work is specifically to have some outcomes for a certain group of people. So that would be the lens to look at it. So not about funding this charity, but what is the work? Who is it with? What, what, are, what are the outcomes of, of, what, of what the organization is doing? And is there strong evidence for that? And, and that would be the starting point. Great, I think Emma's just posted in chat that, that actually answers her question brilliantly. So thank you. Um, and there's there's one um, asking a question about their actual specific project. So I don't know whether you would want them to post that on your um, website for your form. Um, but it's looking about a new build, whether you would fund a new build. We don't fund capital costs. OK. That's an easy one. Sorry. Okay. Not, we're not the right funder for that. OK, brilliant. Thank you. And I think that's all the questions. I don't know if anyone else has any more questions for Babs at all. Before we move on. No? I wouldn't mind actually, Nicola, if you wouldn't okay, mind. Yeah, yeah, carry on, Emma. 
Thank you. Um, hi, Val. Thanks for that this morning. That's helpful. Um, I'm, I'm Emma from Goldie's. Uh, we bummed the nard around applying to Henry Smith again for a little while, but I'm a little concerned we don't quite hit that, uh, what you're looking for. Just wanted to double check and clarify that we've got a lot of local community groups coming to us asking for our services, our activities. So we would fundraise for that and then provide it with them. But presumably, as we're a funder or a, a provider who would provide services across the southwest, if anybody was to apply, it would be that local community. Yeah. Yeah. OK, that's fine. Yeah. So uh, we, you, we consider that like a second tier organisation, you know, that we, we don't fund people to fund other people. It, it, the funding has got to it's like follow the money. The, f the funding's got to go to the organisation that is directly interacting with the beneficiaries. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Thanks, Emma. Just one more question then, Babs. Um, how soon would someone hear um, a stage one application have been successful? Um, it would be um, six to eight weeks. We're, we're running at eight weeks at the moment because we've, we've just got a a sort of peak of demand at the moment, but we we aim for um, no more than eight weeks for a decision around that. Thank you, brilliant. So um, if no one's got any more questions, we'll, I'll pass over to my colleague, Karen Hobbs, who will be talking about um, our grant programmes here at Wiltshire Community Foundation. Thank you, Nicola. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, I know that you know, many people will have probably sat through this presentation before, so I will, um, you know, just as a reminder, go through what um, our main grant programme is. At the end, there's a couple of slides which we update each time because there's different events and um, maybe other grant programmes that we've got running at the same time. So if you can bear to sit through it for another time and um, hear the updates at the end, that's fine, but um, I won't be offended if... Um, if you need to leave or switch off and make a cup of tea. Um, right, let me just uh, share the correct screen. Oh, oh, I've started at the end. Hold on, let me make sure I've got the beginning. Uh, oh, doesn't want to. Oh, can't seem to get rid of the. Uh, Oh, sorry, I think. Right, let me start again. I'm not doing very well here, am I? Right. Ah, I'll get rid of the. Uh, Sorry, Nicola, can you put the slides up? I can't get rid of the thing to put them up properly. Sorry. That's right. It's not, it's, I'm having a technical malfunction this morning. Don't worry. <laughs> Normally that works perfectly fine. It does. <laughs> oh, no, let's um, unshare that, sorry. Oh, <laughs> we're both doing it. <laughs> there we go. This should be now. Yay! There we go. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. So I'll just, uh, yeah. So I'll just go through these. So just to remind everybody or to inform people who don't know before, um, Wiltshire Community Foundation is part of a network of community foundations around the country. Um, we are obviously focused on Wiltshire and Swindon, so very local funder. We do provide grants to groups, but we also have a few programmes that provide grants to individuals, particularly around um, education support. Uh, we do also through our processes um, offer some information and advice for groups and also signposting to sources of further support. Um, we work a lot also to support do donors to give to their communities because obviously all the money that we're giving away has to come from somewhere. And so we work closely with local companies, individuals, other trusts um, to, to create the pot for us to, to give to community groups. Um, and we also do a lot of exploring need in our community. So actually what Babs was talking about in terms of um, 
uh, evidencing need, we do have a report on our website which brings together a lot of the statistical information about Wiltshire and Swindon. So if you want to have a look at that and you need to be sort of quoting any um, particularly statistical evidence for the need in, in your area or in Wiltshire and Swindon generally, then please do have a look at that. You want to go on to the next slide, Nicola? Thank you. Um, so our main programme is our community grants programme. Um, that's about supporting people and communities in need in Wiltshire and Swindon. So again, real local focus. Um, we focus on projects and activities that improve people's lives and we can offer grants for uh, one, two or three years at a time. Our minimum grant is around £750 a year and our maximum grants are up to £5,000 a year. Uh, but just to bear in mind, we can fund capital projects, but only up to £5,000. Um, that wouldn't be £5,000 a year for three years. It's a single grant of £5,000 if it's capital. But if it's running costs, project costs, it can be up to £5,000 a year for up to three years. So to move on to the next. Yeah. So again, our priorities are around grassroots and small to medium sized organisations. Um, we have a priority around supporting people who are on low income. So this is about um, services and support for individuals and communities where the people cannot afford to pay for the services themselves. That's the thing to focus on. Um, and we're particularly th this year focusing on projects that either address the impact of the COVID pandemic, are supporting children and young people, prevent or alleviate poor mental health, tackle poverty and inequality. We are happy to consider applications that fall outside those four um, priorities as long as you can evidence that you have identified a need in your area. Okay, do you want to go into the next one? Um, so grants can be for continuing something you're already doing, so running costs. Um, it can be um, a new activity and we'll consider any reasonable um, costs around um, your core or your running costs, projects and activity costs, and again, capital costs, which would be usually building or equipment, but only if you already have the rest of the funds you need. So if you need more than £5,000, you need to have... Um, the rest of those funds in place and our £5,000 is just sort of topping it up to, to your total. Um, you must need also, uh, you need to start, um, sorry I'll start that sentence again, you need to be able to start spending the money within six months of it being awarded, so you need to be ready to go with your project basically within six months uh, of when it's awarded. Um, we can fund uh, constituted uh, voluntary or community organisations, registered charities. Uh, we do fund not-for-profit companies, including community interest companies, but the direct, there needs to be a minimum of three directors and they need, and the majority of those directors need to receive no payment from the company. So essentially running like a charity would run. Um, you can't be holding um, more than one community grant at a time, so you can only apply for a community grant if you don't already have one. If you do have one of our COVID sort of recovery grants still, you're still spending that, then you, you could consider still making a community grant, um, but we'll, we'll have a look at how you're spending um, the COVID grant uh, when, when we review the application. Obviously do speak to us before if you want to check before you um, make an application. We're always open to discuss applications before uh, you take the time to complete the form. Um, and organisations, this is quite important, organisations need to be local or regional. So you either need to be based in Wiltshire or Swindon or in the region, the south or the southwest of England. And whatever you apply for, those beneficiaries must be living in Wiltshire or Swindon. So we don't fund national organisations to provide activities in our area. Although if you are part of a national organisation, but you have a local management committee in Wiltshire or Swindon, you have your own constitution, your own bank account, that's different. We, we, we will look at you as an individual local branch. Oh, sorry, my phone is going. <laughs> um, a local branch of a national organisation. Sorry, Nicola, do you want to? Yeah. So to be eligible, you must have an active voluntary management committee with at least three people uh, who can't be related to each other or in relationship um, or, or living at the same address. 
there must be three separate independent individuals. Uh, the and the following financial arrangements and documents need to be in place. You need a bank account with two signatories, again, individuals that are not related. Less than 12 months running cost in unrestricted reserves. Um, you may have restricted funds, you may have designated funds, but we're interested in making sure you don't have more than 12 months in your completely freely available reserves. Um, we will be looking for financial records or accounts, some sort of financial plan for the current year that just sort of explains what your income is likely to be, what your expenditure is going to be and what the gap is so that we understand where the grant that you're applying is in with your plans. Uh, we would need to see a recent bank statement and a constitution and we um, are also, uh, as we've always uh, looked at safeguarding and equality policies, but we have recently added a couple of questions to the application form to give you the opportunity to explain to us what you do um, in terms of safeguarding children and adults and, you know, all of your users and volunteers and staff and trustees, and also how you are working to make sure that you um, have equal access and equal opportunities, um, you know, around um, all the different communities that you are working with to make sure that everybody feels safe and welcome um, and particularly in terms of the Equalities Act in uh, making sure that you're making things accessible for everybody. Um, it doesn't matter if you don't have those in place that's fine but we need to we will talk to you about this and look at where you can get access to support around developing those policies. Um, and if you are a very, very new organisation, you don't have all those things in place, you could um, partner with another organisation that could support the application and manage the grant on your behalf. So we could we could um, consider that if, if you are very, very new and don't have everything um, that you need in place to move on next. Um, just to be clear on what we don't fund, so we can't fund organisations that are going to pass that on to um, individuals or families. We don't we don't do those individual um, grants to individuals under the community grant scheme. Um, activities that don't duplicate an existing service, that, sorry, we don't fund activities that duplicate an existing service. This is something really important to get across in your application form and there is a question to cover that. Um, you know, why is your service required? What is the gap that you're filling? You know, who's doing something similar? Why is your work um, needed if there's other things going on? That, that sort of thing. We want to know that you're, you understand the community that you're operating in. Um, we don't um, fund one-off or sponsored events, events, the advancement of religion or medical research, animal welfare, um, party po political activities, um, individuals have already mentioned, we can't fund schools or statutory bodies. I want to move on to the next one. Um, so the so the other grant programmes that we're running at the moment, as well as our own community um, grants, is for anybody based in Swindon, we run the Hayden Wick Fund, that's open at the moment, um, that's for grants up to £3,000, but obviously very specific to the area of Hayden Wick and its immediate surrounds. So if you are working in Swindon um, and you uh, have a significant number of people in the Hayden Wick or surrounding areas that you, um, you support, then that might be one that you would consider. Um, we also work with the uh, High Sheriff and the Police and Crime Commissioner they um, have funds which uh, we will be running uh, one joint programme with them for grants up to £3,000. Um, that's in the planning stages at the moment, but we hope the panel will be, um, well, the programme will be running sort of uh, early part of next year. So keep an eye out for that. That's very focused, as you can imagine, from the people that, that are, the funds are coming from. It's very much focused around um, communities tackling local issues, particularly around antisocial behaviour, crime, drug and alcohol related in incidents, um, uh, you know, reducing reoffending and and violence against girls or, or youth crime. So, um, yeah, ha have a think about the sorts of work that you do and how it might be impacting on those areas. That might be something you could think about. Want to do the next one, Nicola? Yeah. Um, again, this is another one for Swindon. Um, largely, it's a the solar park in Rawton have a community benefit fund. 
Um, they do have large grants up to £20,000, but it's very focused on sort of science, technology, engineering, maths and environment. Um, does also say health or play, but they need to be things that sort of are linked to those themes of science, technology, etc. Um, but, you know, you can be quite creative within that. Uh, but the beneficiaries must be in communities that are within 10 kilometre radius of, of the solar park. So that's mostly Swindon, but a, a few areas into Wiltshire. Um, they also have a small grants programme, but you can see from the list there that that's for some very, very specific communities, um, again, within within their sort of um, area that they cover and that small grants up to £2,000. That uh, will be opening on the 1st of November and the panel, I think decisions will be made around February. So yeah, have a look on our website for any extra information. Um, and then if you need any other support, you can have a look um, on our website and we have a link to a searchable database that would um, have a look at um, particularly local funders. Um, and then also you can um, have a look at My Funding Central, which is at least free for very small groups and that will give you access to more national funders. Uh, information. Um, we work quite closely with Wiltshire Together, Community First, Voluntary Action, Swindon and Wessex Community Action. Um, so uh, do have a look on their websites and look at the support that they can offer, particularly if you need more um, support around sort of governance or policies or fundraising, those sorts of things. They're really good and have lots of other um, information. Wiltshire Together is um, a website that uh, is trying to bring together the voluntary sector within um, uh, within the county. So if you if you want to have a search for that, that may be something you can join. So you'd be joining an online community. Um, and um, uh, other online support is um, National Council for Voluntary Organisations have a, a know-how website that's got lots of information about running organisations um, and I also find the um, Resource Centre um, which is actually based in Sussex but it's got some brilliant information particularly for small community groups and running small community groups so that's another good one for, um, for information and advice. Um, and oh yes our future events yes so um we have been holding um or setting aside a, a day a month where we can book uh one-to-one -one sessions with anybody that wants to have a chat about um either grant funding or uh, any governance issues so do um have a look on our website and you can book onto those um We've got some more workshops that we're planning for early 2022, so keep an eye out for that. We are going to do another session on um, how to use that document that I mentioned that's, that brings together the statistical information about needs in Wiltshire. We'll do another session on how to do better applications and another session on funding strategy. So keep an eye out for those. Um, and then we also run a couple of networks um, that are coming uh, coming up. So we have a youth work network where we talk with youth organisations. The next meeting will be on the 15th of November. And again, we're planning um, Swindon Connecting People Network and Wiltshire Connecting People Network for early 2022. And that's particularly looking at how uh, organisations that are tackling uh, loneliness and bringing people together and because sort of looking at community connections uh, and you can book on any of those via our um, website or um, Eventbrite. And uh, I think that's the end. <laughs> that's everything I want to say. Huh. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That's really kind. Um, I don't think I couldn't see the chats when I was um, at my screen share. So I, I'm not sure. I don't think I'll just quickly scroll through it. Are there any questions? I don't think there are any questions in the chat function. But if you do have anything you'd like to ask us, specifically looking at our um, grant programmes, please do raise your hand or let us know. Okay, no. Thank you. So well, thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the session um, informative. Um, I, as I said at the beginning, I will be sharing the slides after the event and links to the other websites, which we think you might find useful. And we have recorded the session, so we'll also be making that available um, for you to watch again, should you wish, or for those who were unable to join us. 
So it's my pleasure to um, say thank you to Babs um, Evans from the Henry Smith Charity for joining us today and giving us some few information about um, their grant programmes there. Thank you, Babs. Um, and thank you and enjoy the rest of your week, everyone. Thank you.